The infamous pipeline, as it's known, is a phenomenon that's been within the libertarian community for a lot longer than I have. It's the process of somebody who is a libertarian of any description, be they an anarcho-capitalist or a classical liberal, somehow making their way at incredible speeds to becoming part of the alt-right. Now the alt-right is an incredibly vague term that the mainstream media uses to vilify whoever they happen to not like it on any given week, so I'll be clear. I'm going to say alt-right because the word I really want to use is a no-no word in the eyes of YouTube, so know that what I mean is bundle of sticksism if you catch my drift. Yeah, they go all the way there. It's not called a libertarian to conservative pipeline because somehow some people really manage to go all the way from understanding that the liberty of the individual is the paramount of all morality, that government interference in the economy and your personal life is both harmful and immoral, and they zoom all the way to believing the exact opposite in like a week, to then believing in aggressive collectivism and discrimination and even wishing death on different ethnicities and sexualities, that the free market is somehow an immoral force, and that the solution is to kill people who want to participate in it and have a dictatorial government replace most, if not all, economic functions, and that brutal censorship of any dissenting ideas at gunpoint is somehow an okay thing to do. How the hell does this happen? I'll tell you the way it does not happen, which is what some socialists often jump to saying, which is that there is something within our ideas that lend themselves desirability to those ideas of the alt-right. If what I said just before that wasn't enough to highlight how distant those two ideologies are, let me explain in even simpler terms. Libertarians believe that all individuals possess the sovereign and inalienable rights of life, liberty and property, and any use of force against those rights is immoral. If you can tell me how that at all is an appealing principle to the pseudo-philosophy of collectivist protectionism and reactionary exclusion, with punishment of individuals for things that the individual cannot control, I will denounce libertarianism entirely and come and join you in your communes where we can make finger paintings and slam poetry together all day long. I'll even get a tattoo of a hammer and sickle. In order for somebody to go from being a libertarian to the alt-right, they have to abandon every idea they once held and adopt a new set of ideas. Someone who is alt-right is not a libertarian, and anything they say or do is just as much our responsibility as it is yours, which is to say, none whatsoever. A Marxist who moves to this alt-right, which is far more common than you would let yourselves believe, is no longer representative of Marxism. Now as to why the pipeline does exist, I have a few theories, and none of which are mutually exclusive as they apply to different types of people. The first kind of person is the impressionable idea hunter. What I mean by that is, they want to learn about all sorts of obscure political ideologies but only on a surface level. Rather than make a standpoint on ethics and morality, then discover what ideology fits that mould. This is the kind of person you see all the time on political Instagram and I've witnessed it far too many times. They're normally a boy in their early teens who is attracted to libertarianism from the edgy boogaloo memes and identifies with the violent persona of the boog boy, a persona of anger and nothing left to lose, ready to fight for liberty at all costs. The liberty part of that persona is a sideshow to these people. They don't develop their understanding of individualism and instead they actually engage in obscene collectivism. By declaring anyone less radical than themselves as a statist, a redcoat or a tyrant, Without this grounding, the desire for a more radical and more violent system manifests inside them and all it takes is one siege fag to find them in the comments section of a libertarian Instagram post and preach to these misguided and immature sensibilities that they hold. This works out particularly well for the Masonite bundles of sticks, who are the alt-right advocates of all-out terrorism, the kind of which the Christchurch mosque shooter committed. If somebody becomes a libertarian just because they want some fighting to kick off, they become sorely disappointed when we talk, as we do, about self-defence and preservation of rights, not just going out and taking the fight to the people who are deemed responsible for all of the world's problems. Then the bundle of sticks say, look, we're actually doing something, and we're fighting the enemy. Painting mass murder as doing something, and innocent people as the enemy. The enemy is apparently peaceful individuals who these impressionable people once recognised for being just that, now they become exploited by psychopaths 
to view as some sort of threat to their existence. It's downright fucking disgusting. Any rational adult knows this, and that's why these people have to prey on the straggling, impressionable teenagers who are dipping their toes into wider political theory. And we're all in need of a good laugh after this, so let me show you the commander of one of these siege fag groups that was found in Estonia that the police couldn't arrest for his terror plots because he is 13 years old. 1-3 Ah, oh, it's just so brilliant. I brought myself to tears for laughing so hard when I first heard about this a couple of weeks ago. They're called the Führerkrieg Division. That means fire war. Of course, <laughs> of course a fucking 13-year-old came up with that name. Holy shit. Now, that is far and away the most common occurrence of the pipeline. Young kids looking for extremism and wandering around the political spectrum in search of it. But there is another kind, one who makes a journey of philosophy. These people often come into libertarianism by studying the Austrian School of Economics as part of a philosophical quest to find the truth of human nature. As Austrians, we assert that human nature is unrepeatable and is the actions of individuals freely making decisions based on their own scales of value, which come together to allocate resources where the actions of the market show to be most desired. Sounds very true to me, and it sounds very true to these people for quite a while. But they can find themselves stuck in an intellectual trap, where they can't sit peacefully allowing humanity to be what is perceived as chaotic and unplanned without any direct intervention. They believe that their intellectualism commands superiority over the average person, which would not be fully realised by them participating in the market and achieving personal success by providing people with what they willingly desire for mutual gain. A growing sense of superiority leads to a growing want of forceful power the desire to enforce their will through means of violence rather than consensual action. It is not enough for them to tolerate the existence of people who hold opinions and traits that they dislike and just keep them at an arm's length and choose who they associate with. They read Hans Hermann Hoppe and fixate on his quote about physical removal and in that find justification for tyranny by ignoring every other thing he has to say on the matter of individual freedom. Freedom, then, is only an obstacle to them carrying out violence against those who they deem undesirable, and they indulge in pseudo-philosophy to justify violent reactionary views by claiming that they are somehow natural. That freedom defies human nature. At this point, they have clearly abandoned all tenets of the Austrian school and our warnings of dictators. Allow me to rephrase a famous quote from Mises. Every bundle of sticks is a dictator in disguise. These people advocate for tyranny because their superiority complex tells them that they'll be at the top of this hierarchy of violence, as their vast genius means they must know what is best for millions of people. And if the millions don't submit to whatever they decide is the greater good, then they will face their wrath. The pseudo-philosophy doesn't concern itself with determining rational conclusions, only the prescribed conclusions that they want it to. They take their concept of property directly from Marx, that there is somehow a difference between personal and private property, and that private property is only an illusion upheld by law and not a natural human right. Yet to be even more disingenuous than Marxists, as if that's somehow possible, they see this and yet believe private property law should still be enforced yet withdrawn for undesirables as they see fit. This is nothing less than justifying theft for their own personal gain, wrapped up in the bow of the greater good as they declare it. They deny the sovereignty of the individual through insane naturalist leaps. Humans have always formed tribes and relied on the family unit to survive. Therefore, differing ethnicities must be oppressed or removed like that is some sort of logical conclusion. How these people used to understand the basics of praxeology, that only an individual can act and make their own decisions, and then come out with such bullshit circular logic as they do, is just completely beyond me. Now the bigger question behind this is how do we stop it? In my mind, the answer is clear. 
we talk to them, and we talk to the pre-existing bundles of sticks. Deplatforming and endlessly censoring these people is the best possible thing you could ever do to help them grow. When you stop someone from being able to say what they believe is true, you only reaffirm that belief, growing their confidence immeasurably and pushing them to just work harder at it. When these people are debated and have the light shone on their beliefs, we see them for just how wrong they are and hear why we are in fact right. The censoring of socialism and communism in the 20th century only led to the movement growing massively into the 21st century in the Western world. And if we do refute the alt-right directly to their face, the people who they were hoping to recruit for their disgusting and violent ends will see them for exactly what they are. Censorship is the alt-right's best friend. It helps them grow and it tells them that censorship is okay as long as it's done on the right people. By suppressing freedom of speech, you are literally building the framework for them to take over and use it for their own devices and you're helping them grow in their ability to get there. Their whole ideology is a joke and you publicly laugh at jokes, you don't cower in fear at them.